So yesterday I gave a talk uh, for Rafael Marino. Today I give a talk for a bunch of people with whom uh, I've been working over the years. Corentin and uh, Rafael both got a job at CNRS in Lyon, in fact. So lucky guys. And doing is here in Boulder. So that was a lot of computation for this paper. NCA complained. But in fact, it was done mostly in background, that is to say, free, when the machine, Yellowstone, was a wonderful machine, and the machine was <laughs> empty from time to time. So the results are in that paper, and there are a few other papers that you might be interested in. OK. One of the characteristics of turbulent flows is that they are intermittent in the small scales. But in fact, boundary layer flows can be intermittent in the large scales, too, and very strongly so. So here I give an example of balloon measurements of winds in Antarctica. And this is the density of balloons. So you see that it is not homogeneous. They follow the winds. And you can see that the measurement of the velocity can change from, say, 5 or 7 all the way to 30. So you can have very strong gradients of the wind. Similarly, you can have very strong gradients of the momentum. Okay. Another example, this time in the ocean, so this is the skewness. If the process was Gaussian, the skewness would be 0, and those are the pale colors. But uh, in fact, if I recall the, the color bar, you have between minus 1 and plus 1 for the um, strong red and blue. And you see that around those two currents that are marked by a solid line, you have a lot of activity along the fronts, which is, of course, not surprising. But nevertheless, it's nice to measure. Similarly, here, that's the direct American direct, OK. Uh, it's a QG numerical simulation at not very high wells, uh, not very high resolution. But nevertheless, even though it's QG, you see that there is a lot of intermittency. Here it's a, a map of the energy dissipation rate uh, over the old Earth. And those are zooms. And those are the PDF with a log here. So uh, the conclusion of the, these authors is that it's log normal for the dissipation. So the dissipation is not at all homogeneous or quiet. So what kind of numbers are we talking about in those flows? Um, and I like these measurements coming from, I think, the PhD of Nico Ashin. And there it's measurements taken in the Drake Passage at the very south of South America. And you have uh, the ocean, the depth up to or down to four kilometers. In black is the bathymetry. There are mountains at the bottom of the ocean. And you can see that um, the flow speed, apart from the two boundary layers, is kind of blue. And blue is kind of 0.1 meter per second. The buoyancy frequency, again, away from the two boundaries is green. So it's about 10 minus 3 per second. Coriolis is 10 minus 4 at mid-latitude. Well, and that's still mid-latitude, the direct passage. And the land scale, we can take it as being typical of those mountains. It's about a kilometer. Uh, they look smaller here, but when you look at the uh, data, the, they come with 800 meters to a kilometer. So when you put all those numbers together, we're talking about flows in the ocean that have a full number, which is 0 0.1. They're not as small as what Keith Juden was mentioning. And I think it's because of the landscape here. I'm taking the depth. I am not taking the planetary scale. Okay, And Reynolds number, of course, are very high, as usual. OK, so what are the equations that we're going to play with? Well, it's the incompressible but Boussinesque uh, equations for the velocity and the density. But here, we have a density whose units is a velocity, a bit like an MHD, the Alvin velocity, so that I don't have to remember where to put the factor n. Um, when I compare energies. OK. Um, there are four governing dimensionless parameters of those equations, so that's very bad news for doing um, parametric studies. But we eliminate the Prandtl number by saying that it is equal to 1, which is not too bad for either the ocean or the atmosphere. And we're also eliminating the Reynolds number because at the resolution that we have, we want the highest possible Reynolds number. OK. And it's still small, so we see no point of making it, making it smaller. So there are only two controlling parameters left now, which is the full number and the Rossby number. 
Where's Reynolds? Oh, yes, I said I eliminated it. Okay. And now we are also basically cutting parameter space in two, but saying I'm going to be uh, motivated by either the ocean or the atmosphere, where the gravity waves are always faster by a factor of 5 to 100. So we're not going to explore the other side of the, of the story because we can't do everything, right? So this is the highest resolution run we have at 4,000. By the way, physics of fluid could not print the full image at that resolution. So you see something that has not been published. And this is the vertical vorticity at the peak of the dissipation. There is no forcing. And you see these vortices are basically the size of the initial conditions. But at the border of the vortices, there is an absolute ma mess. Please note, this is log scales. You are, you are seeing really deep into the, the range of values for the vorticity. The imposed rotation is 2.7 or twice. Twice the imposed rotation, whereas the root mean square velocity is 17. In other words, those flows, even though the full number is 0.02, if I recall, they are very turbulent in the sense that you are pr producing a lot of uh, vorticity in those lanes. And for those who are interested, it's a Bolzano or Bukov scaling to our surprise. Now, in the fourth case, which will not be the main subject of this talk, but just to show you what the structures look like, we are forcing at a scale which is about a tenth of the box. So when you're doing that, you're losing in Reynolds number, so that's bad. But anyway, you see that the flow, because of the rotation, there is an inverse cascade. And therefore, you are forming large scales in the form of large eddies, larger than the forcing scale, and long filaments. But on the other hand, at the border of those structures, you have very intense instabilities leading to very intense um, activity. Here I am plotting the velocity. OK. So what is the parametric study? Well, at fixed food number, we vary the Rosby number. At fixed Rosby number, we vary the food number. And we also do some experiments at fixed n over f, so values for the ocean or for the atmosphere. Now, because of our choice of having n over f larger than 1, basically the Rosby number is not very small for all the runs, but only in a subset of the run, which are around here. Oh, I forgot to say, sorry. <laughs> So we have, um, this is decaying flows. The Reynolds number is going to be around 12,000. Uh, the initial temperature fluctuations are zero. So we are taking turbulence and see how the waves affect the turbulence and not the opposite. So no temperature fluctuation, we'll see them grow, no forcing. The code <coughs> is something that you can uh, ask uh, Duane for. And uh, there will be also some lower resolution runs with either isotropic or QG, quasi-geostrophic initial conditions, so that we at least explore a bit parameter space and worry not too much about the fact that we chose some very special initial conditions in the temperature. OK, so I'm going to take a point of view which is not the usual point of view. I'm going to come up with ex cathedra, with three constitutive laws for those flows. And then using those laws, I will try to predict the mixing scaling. And by mixing, we mean really how much dissipation is there in those flows. If it was only pure waves, there would be no dissipation because the Reynolds number are very high and there is no transfer to the small scales. So as the waves steepen and interact with eddies, how much dissipation do we have in those flows? So I'll talk about these laws for potential and vertical energy and dissipation efficiency. I look at the consequences, and then I'll give some consequences. So this is as good as it gets. The scaling from here on is not going to be as good, OK? Why? I don't know why this quantity called the Ellison scale uh, scales so well. And it's as a function of the full number. And most of the plots I'll show you are as a function of of the full number, which, by the way, varies by almost three orders of magnitude. It's a parametric study, right? So the Ellison scale, from the turbulence point of view, is I want a scale that really tells me 
about the potential part of the flow. So I take the potential energy, I take the Brunweissala frequency, and I make a scale with it. Now, this is not how they defined it, of course. And it's basically the scale on which it, that it takes for um, an instability uh, to, to dissolve in the flow, to disappear, and to homogenize, homogenize the flow. I like to normalize things. And the natural scale to do that is the integral scale, which is defined here, was defined by Axel also this morning. And as a function of prune number, boy, that's a linear relationship. If I don't know what a linear relationship is, I have it here, right? But now let's think about it. Because what is the Edison scale? It's the potential, say the RMS temperature, divided by N, food divided by the Brun's Weissala frequency, normalized by the integral scale, which is here too. So basically I'm saying that the potential and kinetic energy are equal within a factor across three orders of magnitude of full number. Not everywhere, but almost. So let's look at it. Now the first time I saw that plot, and please note that here it's not log log. So you have a linear relationship in the ratio of potential to kinetic energy. And basically, it varies by a factor two. But the first time I saw that, I said, yeah, it's a scatter plot. I don't know what to do with it. And now I'm going to do something with it. I'm going to say that those two guys are equal. Within a numerical factor, which on the basis of statistical mechanics, there is one mode for temperature and two modes for velocity, taking into account the incompressibility condition. So it should be around 0.3. Not too bad. There is another difficulty with that data set, which is it's decaying. So I can't do temporal averages. So the data is not very good, right? But OK, we'll make do with it. So first law, those two guys are proportional. That is to say, they do not depend on the, on the controlling parameter. That is true for the full number. The Reynolds number, as I said, doesn't vary very much. But I think it's also true. Now this one, you could criticize me. Because I'm also saying that the vertical energy, as measured by the total kinetic energy, is also independent of full number. I'm not saying they're equal. And in fact, there is a factor here, A, which is small, but it is not depending on full number. Now, you could tell me, oh, come on, girl. You really say that's flat? Well, let's forget about this regime where the waves prevail and the initial conditions prevail. And let's forget about the, this regime where the full number is 1, and basically we are getting to homogeneous isotropic turbulence. I know nothing about that. But let's look in there. And yes, indeed, it's a pretty flat curve. Now, I forgot to tell you what I plot. The colors are binning in Rossby number. It is not the optimal binning from a physics point of view. But Duane chose to have about the same number of points in each bin, so it had to be that way. So the only flows that have an effect of rotation, basically, are the blue flows, right? Those flows and those flows. And <coughs> the symbols are different shape, but if they are bigger, which I see one here and there's maybe some others, uh, it means that the viscosity is bigger because we were asked to do a variation with Reynolds number, so we had to make the Reynolds number smaller or the viscosity larger. So since there were a few of them, they have a bigger symbol. And finally, the double stars are runs that are QG, quasi geostrophic, as initial conditions. So law number two have a proportionality between the vertical and the kinetic energy. And law number three, this is a beauty. I, mean, I was not expecting something so nice, although this is what you expect, and some other people have had uh, equivalent results. What, what are we plotting? We are plotting the kinetic energy dissipation as measured in the flow through the, um, through the enstrophy in units of what it would be if dimensional analysis worked. <coughs> So that's the energy, u square divided by the eddy turn over time, or u cube over L. For a fully turbulent flow, which is here, the full number is one or bigger, you expect that to be one. 
The fact that it is not exactly one, this ratio, is just like the critical Rene number for this geometry or that geometry, there are some external constraints that make it not exactly what you expect from dimensional analysis, but it's a folder one. At low, very low, true number, this is constant, and I think it is determined by the viscosity or the Reynolds number. That is to say, those waves are strong, they don't couple, they don't dissipate. And in between, this is a magnificent, almost magnificent, linear dependency. Now, you could say maybe because of the rotation, the power here is not one. Or maybe there is a physical effect of a correction to a linear uh, <coughs> dimensional scaling. I do not know. So it is easy to see on this plot that you have three regimes, just like for stratified flows. We didn't invent anything here. We just added the rotation and found the same thing. You have a regime where the waves prevail. You have a regime where the eddies prevail, where we're going to recover uh, uh, homogeneous turbulence, hopefully, at some point. And in between, the link is linear for the energy dissipation. So we know for a given food number how much energy dissipation we have. And I was asked by, uh, by Joe Trivia yesterday about uh, local instability. So you have a zoom on one-tenth of one-tenth of the box for the 4,000 cube run. And uh, you see a Kelvin L modes. I think that's the vorticity magnitude. It's, you see a Kelvin L modes uh, instability. You see better in the temperature. And this is the gradient Richardson number, which is white and pink is zero or even below zero. So locally, this flow is terribly unstable. OK. So we have those three regimes. And how can we explain a linear dependency of dissipation on food number? Well, it's very, very simple. In fact, it's an argument for the MHD guys that dates back to Hiroshnikov Kreknan. Or you could say it dates back to the wave turbulence analysis. So. I am going to transfer energy to the small scale. But because I have waves, this convolution term is not so efficient. It's not going to happen so fast if I decide to measure that in terms of time scales. So I'm going to say that the transfer time is the eddy turnover time, which dimensionally it is for homogeneous isotropic turbulence. And I want it to be larger, so I divide by my small parameter, which is a full number, right? That's it. That once you do the algebra, replace the turnover time and the full number by its definition, which is the ratio of the two times, you get the energy dissipation, which is the energy divided by the time. And the time I take is the transfer time. And lo and behold, you find that the dissipation measured compared to the dissipation dimensional varies as the full number. OK. So where is the rotation, you could ask? Well, the rotation is there, but we did everything we could to prevent it from acting. A, we don't force, so there's not an inverse cascade. B, we put the initial conditions at small scale, uh, sorry, at large scale, small wave number. And C, what does it do? N over F is larger than 1, so the gravity waves are always faster. So the rotation doesn't, is being biased again against in these computations. OK, does that make any sense? So it's uh, an observation um, uh, around Hawaii, the Hawaiian Ridge in the ocean, which I like because I think I can understand it. So what do I have? Oops, what did I do? Wrong thing, sorry. Um, I have time here, 6, 12, 18 hours. It's clearly the tide, right? So something happens. There is a ridge at the bottom of the ocean. And every 12 hours, the tide is arriving. It's breaking on those obstacles, the grid. It's grid turbulence, in a sense. And there is a lot of, what is this? Um, of the velocity gets larger, something like 0.2. And the dissipation gets larger, something like 10 minus 6. Now, can I make sense of those numbers? Well, OK, I took a velocity of 0.1. The land scale, again, 1,000 meters. The turnover time is three hours, which means 
I excite that thing, that with here is about three hours, it dies, and then it gets exciting again when the next tide arrives. The, the Brunel Weissala frequency is 10 minus 3, so the full number 0.1, as we said before. Now, the, dis, the dimensional dissipation u cube over L is about 10 minus 6. In other words, this flow, when it is excited, excites waves which steepen, which dissipate, and then it dies again. But this is compatible with an analysis where the dissipation becomes large uh, when um, there is turbulence. Okay, so we have three laws, and we're going to look at those horrible letters up there, which are called the mixing efficiency, the flux Richardson number, and some other things. It's very complicated, but in fact, it's very simple. Because what do we do? We look at the total energy variation as a function of time for the kinetic and potential energy, and what do we have? We have the dissipation of kinetic and potential energy, and we have that exchange ter term coming from the waves called the buoyancy flux, right? Okay, so everything is defined here. And now I am going to use the three laws to estimate this mixing efficiency, right? So I remind you of the three laws here. That's simple algebra, so let's take regime two. The temperature and the vertical velocity are basically the velocity, and the dissipation is full number times the, di the dimensional dissipation, and therefore you find that this ratio, which is called the mixing efficiency, varies as one over foot square. Whereas in regime one, in regime three, when the, when the, uh, when the eddies are strong, now the dissipation is the dissipation, the dimensional dissipation. I'm losing that food factor, and, then it's four, and therefore it's one over food, or buoyancy balance number to the minus one half, which I'm told is observed. And here's the numerical data. So when you look at the numerical data, you say, good luck, right? We have a very high mixing efficiency um, for strong waves, and this is because of the way it is defined. If the waves are strong, epsilon, the dissipation due to basically to tra nonlinear transfer is close to zero, and that goes to infinity, which is what we are saying here. So if we now plot the two predictions, it's not necessarily that bad. In other words, you can make some sense of this data. But the problem with this data is the buoyancy flux, which has a very bad taste of not being of a given sign. So there are a lot of fluctuations. OK. And now you can plot this uh, same uh, mixing efficiency as a function of buoyancy Reynolds number, which I redefine here. And uh, the scaling is compatible at small at uh, high values of the, uh, the Reynolds number with a one-half flow. And I think this line, but maybe I forgot to talk about this thing here. It seems that some, in, in particular in the oceanography community, say that this should be a constant at a uh, high enough buoyancy Reynolds number. I don't know. It doesn't look like it, but of course we're not necessarily in the same parameter range as they are. But it doesn't look too constant to me. Okay. So same thing here. This is the flux Richardson number, which has the advantage of being normalized, right? So it's a buoyancy flux divided by the whole right-hand side in the momentum equation. So when the waves are strong, epsilon is small, and this is one. Indeed, in the wave regime, we see that it is one. When the waves are weak, well, uh, B is zero, so this is going to zero with some power law. Um, the data gives us a slope of point minus 0.57, and the two laws that we could predict with our little model is two in the intermediate regime and one here. So I don't know, okay? But I think there is. Um, I hope some people have ideas of how to make that better. And maybe the forcing is one solution, but with the forcing, I have an inverse cascade, so that's, that is a problem. So I think the problem should be redone for pure stratified flows. OK. Another way, which is simpler, of measuring 
uh, how much dissipation there is is how much dissipation there is in the um, potential field as compared to the kinetic field or the sum of the two. And here I did it as a function of the Richardson number to introduce the, the gradient, the vertical gradients of the velocity. And you see that in the middle, in the middle range, where there are a competition between waves and eddies, this is rather constant to a factor about three. Which is what you expect if, in fact, the potential kinetic um, and kinetic energy are also in that ratio. So it all figures. Uh, I don't know how much time do I have because uh, four minutes. Four minutes? Oh, let me let me jump this. As a function of Reynolds number, I don't get any data there. Right? Um, now the binning is in food number, and you see that for a given color, um, I have a constant mixing efficiency or a constant dissipation in constant quote unquote, dissipation e efficiency independent of the Reynolds number. But I like a Reynolds number of 10 to the 4. I have all those values. Clearly, Reynolds number is not the determining parameter in that study. So what is the role of rotation? I've already talked a bit about it. Let me skip that if I have only four minutes. This is just to tell you that a lot of people since 2005 have seen when they plot the flux or the skewness, which is kind of the flux, um, as a function of scale, they find that the flux has two lobes. It's not one and then zero in the other range. So Scott, in 2005, he says he doesn't believe his data, but I think he should. Maybe he does now. Maurice and Moissy in Orsay in a rotating tank. Um, you have Alexakis with imposing a magnetic field, a, a uniform magnetic field, and see, seeing that there are two cascades that are emerging with constant flux, almost, right? It's numerical in three dimensions uh, for both range. You have the solar wind, which is an old uh, 2007 observation, where the authors, Raffaele Marino and Lucas Orisovalvo, say, uh, we do see a change of sign. This is unusual. We don't understand, but it's there. And uh, you have din um, direct numerical stimulation of cafe if you're bad with rotation or, or ocean drifters. In other words, there are a lot of instances where in nature we see that we can have a flux of energy which is both positive and negative and both remarkably constant. Right? Okay. So that's what we observe. Now what we're saying is that with having an input of energy at this scale, it goes to the small scales in a direct energy cascade. It goes to the large scales in an inverse energy cascade with constant flux but then the question becomes, what is the ratio of those two fluxes? And the same argument that I used to say it's a weak wave turbulence argument to say that the energy dissipation scales linearly with full number. But now I, that's for the small scales. But now at the large scales, for a given full number, I have the more energy going to the large scales, the smaller the Rossby number. And therefore, the controlling parameter is the product of the full number and the Rossby number, and this is what shows for a series of numerical simulations done by Raffaele Marino. Okay. Another perspective is shallow fluids. Um, I had not realized until uh, Pablo decided to make the code uh, a matchbox instead of being a, a sugar cube. And if you impose that the grid be the same in all three directions. That imposes that if you have an aspect ratio of that box, of say, is 8 to 1, then in the z direction, you have only wave numbers that are proportional to 8. And therefore, you have a very strong shear. Those boxes facilitate shear like crazy. So that's all kinds of filaments that can form in there. And that's fun. So summary and perspective. Um, there are three distinct regimes in rotating stratified turbulence, just like there is in, um, in stratified flows. Uh, the three regimes are easy to guess. The waves dominate. The waves and eddies compete. The eddies dominate. The mixing efficiency varies linearly in a large domain of full number with the full number, which seems to be the controlling parameter. We don't have much information about variation with Reynolds number. 
a lot of local instabilities, which will be very interesting to study in detail. Um, the role of initial condition, I mean, the data is good in the end, at least for the Ellison scale. The question is whether our data is biased in some sense. I don't know how, but it could be. So it would be nice that if other people redo those types of simulation. And some of those results have been obtained by other people in slightly different contexts. Comment? I think it's interesting. The I don't know if it's quite the same number, but we have a favorite number in the atmosphere at the top of the boundary layer. Uh, the ratio of the entrainment flux to the surface flux is a magic point too. There's a little bit with the shear. In a sense, it's sort of a measure of how the mixing efficiency of that particular system. And it's a very robust number. And I just wonder whether it's a cousin to what you've found there. Well, it's a uh, I mean, uh, we don't find point two, right? Uh, OK, so the other, my other, uh, OK, we find that the point two is for pure convection. But if you add wind and things like that, it can get bigger, smaller, et cetera. And it's just that's the usual canonical case. Right. Uh, the other thing is, uh, Harm Yonker shown very clearly, uh, that number is a very strong function of what the Prandtl number is. And so you had one. Uh, go ahead. Oh, absolutely. I mean, the, I have no idea of what happens with Prandtl numbers that are different from one, except that I will take the usual argument when I'm told that for MHD. Uh, which is that the turbulence produces its own eddy diffusivity and magnetic diffusivity or temperature di diffusivity, which are very close to one. And that was shown a long time ago by Forster, Stephen, and Nelson. So unless you go to extremes, 10 minus 6 or whatever, um, in a range like for the ocean of the atmosphere, we are at a 7 or 0.3 or not very f far from one, I don't expect a lot of difference, except perhaps uh, for anisotropy effects in, in the range that's between the down and the equivalent uh, scale uh, for dissipation. Hello. Uh, any other comments? I was curious about your, uh, when you were talking about your fronts, how, uh, how strong are they compared to like the ones I was playing with? That I don't know because I don't know how strong your fronts are. But the only thing we looked at was that we were very surprised by their thickness. So you form, you first form this, a front, I think that's what you call, and then it becomes at later time a filament, right? So now this width, um, th this is governed by the dissipation here at the, at the front level. But the filament, um, I don't remember. Yeah, no, okay. I, okay. We'll have to. Now, this is a very special computation because we decided to go orthogonal to random initial conditions or forcing. So it's a Taylor Green forcing, which is highly symmetrical, doesn't have vertical velocity, and has a strong shear in the vertical, right? So it's, in a sense, mimics the flows that yeah. you guys are interested in. But in that case, because of all the symmetries, and it's a spectral code that's pretty accurate. Um, it preserves a lot of symmetries in the structures, and it takes a long time to break them. But nevertheless, so we helped ourselves by taking the Taylor Green. But nevertheless, we uh, easily formed without boundaries or without I don't know what else. Uh, we easily formed those fronts and then those filaments. Hmm. Well, let's thank Anik again.
Can everyone hear me? Very good. Thank you. Well, I thank the organizers for the invitation to speak at this fascinating multidisciplinary meeting. I've learned a huge amount. I want to switch scales now completely to a rotating magnetized environment, the scale of whole galaxies. The research I'm going to talk to you today about is uh, with my, a group of collaborators in Hamburg Observatory, led by uh, Bastian Kurtgen, who was a postdoc there, with Roby Banerjee and Wolfram Schmidt. So I want to just set the stage Put in your mind the kind of system I'm talking about now. These uh, excellent observations now that we have of external galaxies where we can map out for the first time the structure of what the diffuse gas is, the dense star forming gas, where the giant molecular clouds are that form stars in this scale. So we are looking at a galaxy here now, 10 kiloparsecs in radius across the H1 gas, the atomic gas, the diffuse gas that fills the medium, is gathered into these longer filaments. And the red circles indicate regions of very high density, densities of 200 particles per centimeter cubed, which we have giant molecular clouds up to ranges 10 to the 6 solar masses found in these filaments. Uh, they are found only in these filaments, where you see the dense regions. And we have star clusters associated, that's the yellow, associated with these uh, GMCs, star cluster, a star is born typically in a star cluster. That it's natal condition. Star clusters are formed in giant molecular clouds. And we've learned that molecular clouds may be, have ages of a few 10 to 15 million years, perhaps, by this data. And this is uh, all extremely interesting now to ask the following question. So this me medium, the interstellar medium we've been talking about, the starting condition for all the dynamics I'm going to discuss is strongly magnetized. Stars form the GMCs. GMCs are seen to be turbulent. We now know that they're magnetized. They're very highly filamentary. Some are very long, uh, that we see hundreds of parsecs long as far as giant molecular clouds go. Um, the interesting thing is that if you start with a medium that has only one particle per centimeter cubed of gas, that medium is strongly magnetized. In fact, the ratio of the magnetic energy, the, the gravitational to the magnetic energy density is very small. This is a magnetically dominated medium, which would completely start, uh, suppress gravitational instabilities and in star formation. Yet GMCs forming out of this medium somehow, reaching densities of 200, uh, are places where the magnetic field now is down from gravity by a factor of about three. We say it's magnetically supercritical the mass to fluxes of order two to three. So how did you start from a medium which star formation would be strongly suppressed, magnetically dominated, and create a some parts of the medium, filamentary, in which star formation can now proceed? That's the question we want to answer with galactic, with the dynamics I want to show you. Um, so just a few words. We do now know much more about the magnetic fields in galaxies on large scale, just to show you a few observational efforts here, uh, we see on the scale of whole galaxies, there's ordered fields in spiral galaxies shown here. Um, this observation shown in, in uh, reasons where H alpha shows you where star formation is occurring. Uh, the B field shown here in vectors. Um, so this is work done at radio telescopes, six centimeters images here from Beck. Um, here in this galaxy, we have 10 to 15 microgauss fields. This region can support a galactic dynamo, which has been used to explain this large-scale structure of the magnetic field. Um, another example is this famous spiral galaxy here. Again, we see spiral arms. We see the magnetic field structure here. It's uh, kind of offset from the spiral arms. The large-scale dynamo theory has been applied to understand this large-scale magnetic structure. Um, there's some details. My talk is not about galactic dynamos here. Uh, I'm going to come to that in a moment. But from observations like this, one can start determining things like uh, a distribution of magnetic fields that we see in galaxies. So this is from review by Fletcher et al. Uh, with tens of galaxies now available where we can measure both the in-sky and perpendicular components of the field by making rotation measurements and polarization measurements, we know the complete field structure. Um, and that those fields are very strong, as I've indicated. 
Um, the typical field and the ordered field may be order five microgauts. Um, now, the total fields by 17 microgauss or so, and that would magnetically dominate an interstellar medium. In the dense gas, where the picture changes, Zeeman measurements have now been made of the molecular gas itself. So here's an example of Zeeman measurements shown here as a function of the density. Here's the densities of 100, here's the 1,000, here we're in 10 to about 1,000 here, et cetera. About, uh, sorry, 100 and getting into thousands up here. So in the diffuse medium, density is about tens, the magnetic field strength through Zeeman measurements does not depend on the density. That's a word for saying that you're magnetically dominated in your medium. When you get to densities here of around 100, or a few hundred, the picture changes. You're now in the self-gravitating gas. Uh, these are the Zeeman measurements. And this line indicates a ratio of mass to flux of about 2 to 3. That is. The magnetic energy is down from gravity by a factor of two to three <clears throat> in strength. Um, one aspect of molecular cloud dynamics I want to feature also, it features large scale flows along the filaments. Here is one of the discovery papers on this, Kirk et al., where we're now looking at a filamentary molecular cloud. Here's a cluster that's forming. And one sees filament aligned flows flowing along the filament into this region of a cluster here. Clusters are, remember, associated with molecular clouds. And so uh, we have this as aspect that um, filamentary flows feed these denser regions. Over here, we see the fact that the turbulence, a big topic in this meeting in molecular clouds, is supersonic. Thermal velocity, thermal sound speeds are uh, shown in here, so the interstellar gas um, as a density, column density of 10 to the 22. Uh, and we look at the, uh, and another thing that the filamentary clouds, we measure the mass per unit length as a measure of how strong the gravitational field will be. Uh, when we are above column densities, characteristic of molecular clouds here, we get into suprathermal line widths, whose origin is always an interesting topic of discussion in all meetings of star formation. The mass per unit length in these clouds can get up to 1,000 solar masses per parsec, as opposed to thermal velocities where you could only have about 16 solar masses per parsec. So I hope I framed the problem of the solution about how do you get molecular clouds in such galaxies. It's been a big, historically interesting topic in the whole field. Um, originally, if you have an ideal gas, uh, Magnetic field energy scales with gravitational energy. So if once the magnetic field dominates, it can never be dominated by gravity again. That's the ideal MHD case. To circumvent that, Mostel and Spitzer proposed that the field could perhaps weaken in places by some sort of non-ideal amipolar diffusion. That process turns out to be too slow to account for the formation of molecular clouds, huge regions in 10 to 10, only 10 million years. Gravitational freefall time in such regions is you know, about 20 million years or so. So one of the key ideas presented early on was a Parker instability, buoyancy instability, magnetic fields bubbling vertically out of the disk, having material flow back along streamlines into magnetic valleys. The gathering of such material might be a great way of moving kiloparsec scale gas and gathering them to the clouds. Um, this was seriously pursued a number of years ago in the theoretical models here by Elmagreen. Uh, you have to move gas from kiloparsec scales just to have enough gathered into your GMC. Uh, the trouble with these early models being 1D is you never get much of a density enhancement in one in particular valley. You're never able to grow enough uh, cloud in that sort of way. So it was kind of forgotten about. Alternatives involving in gravitational instabilities and disks, cloud-cloud collisions, colliding flows of various kinds have been proposed. So this brings me to our point. Our point is that we used uh, global simulations of a galaxy using a flash adaptive mesh code. Uh, and in this, uh, showing details here, adaptive mesh we could refine to about 8, 19 parsec in scale. In other words, a number of re resolutions across 100 solar 100 parsec cloud. 
Uh, this runs very fast on a GPU type architecture. The galaxy, we put gas in a model potential for a galaxy, as other people have done. This galaxy is a flat rotation curve, so there's a shear. The angular velocity goes as 1 over r in such a setup. It has a vertical density profile, well measured and studied in many observations, uh, a such squared uh, a vertical profile for the gas density. Um, there's cooling here, the gas will cool down. We set the gravitational instability is set by something called the Tumre Q parameter. Tumre Q measures the relative strength of shear and, and pressure as compared to gravity in determining the stability of the gas. When Q is less than one, gravity is one against those two supporting mechanisms. Uh, we set up the galaxy to be uh, just a, a reasonably stable but cooling. Uh, we start with an initial field, not by dynamo. An azimuthal field, there's no spiral waves in this system, so any field should be sheared out into a strictly toroidal magnetic field. From observations, a density would scale as rho to the one half. So a plasma beta parameter for such a model is constant throughout your disk, and if it's set to 0.25, that matches the diffuse ISM data as ma mapped out by Beck in the observation. The mass to flux ratio compared to the critical mass to flux ratio shown here is uh, a value of 0.45 for a galaxy set up this way. The ISM is magnetically super, uh, subcritical. So I will show you two movies. The first one is the hydro simulation in which you will see uh, without magnetic fields, the galaxy will break up into rings as predicted by the Tumre axis metric instability. Those rings will uh, which gravity dominates will gradually fragment, and these fragments at the end of the movie will interact with one another. And if I can get this going, this will go out. There are the rings forming. You see it's going very fast. The globs over the uh, GMCs are long tails from the GMCs. They get close to one another and then undergo tidal interactions with one another. These tidal tails, when you see GMCs interacting with one another at the end of the simulation, so uh, you're starting from this hydrodynamic instability. This is a mimicked exact reproduction of work by Tanner, Taskin, uh, Tanner and uh, Tan, uh, sorry, um, Tasker and Tan a few years ago. We now put this in with a magnetic field so described into the model, and you get something in the first 300 million years that looks quite different. <clears throat> Suppression these kind of spirals moving out. Then you see fragments of the molecular clouds. Then they come into interaction at the end towards 500 million years of, of, of uh, execution here. Here's a three frames comparing hydro up here at these three different times, 100 million years, 200, 300. Hydrodynamics, gravitational instability breaks this into rings. The rings fragment into molecular clouds. These are dense regions, more than 200. And thirdly, there is a phase where these molecular clouds start tidally interacting with one another. In the magnetic case, complete suppression of this instability. What you see first is these radial spokes coming out. Well, after a while, at three, this is uh, into spokes, and 300 million years, you see we get dense fragments along these spokes, and then they'll go later into a stage of interaction. If you look sideways, take a torus and move around the torus in the disk, you see that you have a lovely Parker modes. You can see these white field lines undulating up and down, up and down, up and same, mirror symmetric below. This is a 3D simulation. It's not reason. Didn't have to be symmetric in this case. Uh, you see that the density is enhanced in the magnetic valleys. Concentrations here, 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 here. Density in fact means of a factor of a few, but uh, uh, the, this is well fit. The spacing of these modes uh, are spaced toroidally uh, very well, nicely fit by Parker instability in this gas. Here's the toroidal wave number. This is for the very, we have two field strengths of a beta is 10, magnetically very weak, beta 0.25, very strong. That's the black initial case. And then as time goes on, uh, you see that the uh, vertical field component is growing with time. So why do we get, and this is an indication that in these calculations, 
the Parker mode is faster than the tomb ray mode, shown here. It's a function of radius. Through most radii, the Parker modes, which are black, are definitely taking off uh, within a few million, uh, with less than two million years, whereas the tomb ray modes are much slower. So magnetism is kicking this galaxy off right away. And that's the reason why we broke into these radial spokes. So what are those magnetic valleys? Here's three pictures. Magnetic valleys where the gas gathers. Imagine this. And around each toroid, we've got Parker instability coming around like that. Then takes the next radius. Uh, find all the magnetic valleys. Go out the next radius. Do the toroid again. Uh, find that magnetic valley. Do that for each radius. Connect up all the magnetic valleys and uh, troughs, and you now have what we call magnetic valleys, shown here um, <clears throat> at different times. You see very nice ordered radial spokes come. They're being bent back because you have shear. With time, uh, there's a flow along the filaments. So you start fragmenting at about 300 million years, and that brings flows along the filaments over kiloparsec scales gathering you into GMCs that are indeed million solar masses. These are not small entities anymore, or small fluctuations. It's this global simulation of, of galaxy in 3D rather than some local shearing box calculation that tells you you can gather gas in the magnetic valleys in this kind of a way. Just a few more blow-ups here, just showing you close up. You can see the undulating field lines here, up and down, gas in the magnetic valley. A few, um, a few rotations later, this is starting to fragment up as gravity takes hold. And then we started having more isolated clouds, GMCs forming the filaments. Let's look a little bit more in the dynamics. Um, I've lost track of time. Do I have a few minutes yet? Great. All right, I'll slow down. Um, so here, the mass to flux ratios, uh, remember, our issue is, can we find, the, will the molecular clouds be supercritical? Will they be dominated by gravity or magnetism? So here are the filaments. We Here just a bimode, forget this scale. Just bimode, we've got uh, red indicating supercritical, white is subcritical. And you see every place where we've got the gas filament, we are in a supercritical state. What's the reason for that? Well, if you think about it, we've got this magnetic valley that I'm falling into. As I fall into this, I'm not dragging much flux into my magnetic valley. But all the gas that was lifted up is now draining into this region. So I'm collecting gas, but I'm not dragging in magnetic flux into this magnetic valley. So I'm changing the mass to flux ratio as this filament build the valley builds up by accretion of matter that falls in uh, along the valley. So, we do naturally get through this Parker instability, global ones, that the, we get supercritical gas in the filaments from the get-go. Will this gas become self-gravitating? Is there enough infall here? Are these really gravitationally bound uh, molecular clouds or not? To assess that, one, lo one, one looks at the critical line mass. Um, if you have a gravitational filament, gravity, self-gravitating filament, Gravity operates in a filament differently than in 3D. The condition for gravitational instability is twice the sum of this sound speed squared and the velocity dispersion squared divided by g. If your m to l is greater than this, then you're gravitationally unstable. You will fragment that gravitationally. This was first pointed out in a paper. This should be 64, a famous paper by Ostrecker. The magnetic valleys are more prone to gravitational instability, therefore. So look at this color map. The critical mass, to, uh, mass per unit length is about a few thousand to about 10 to the fourth here. 10 to the fourth is this yellow color. All of the filaments are yellow. The, uh, so they are, um, uh, I think I got this the wrong way around. The, Sorry. Uh, yeah, so the regions here that are uh, magnetically, sub, uh, in which the line mass are gravitationally quite unstable are these kind of filamentary structures that you will see in here. So these things are also, with time, becoming gravitationally 
stable in our, the velocity dispersions are indeed very, very large um, in, in the, in the, in, in the, as I'll show you in the data to come. The velocity dispersions are created, we think, by, by gravitational interactions. The source of the turbulence is a very important issue here. So let's look at two times. Let's look now vary some parameters. This is a paper in preparation from this data. So we'll look at very dominated magnetically and almost hydrodynamic over here, how the behavior ha depends on the initial magnetization of your interstellar medium. Um, so at the moment of fragmentation in these models, um, we're showing here the density structure here. Uh, so there's the column density shown in all of these. The column density here is about 10 to the 22 grams per centimeter cube. That indicate that is the density of molecular clouds. That's the column density. The diffuse interstellar medium would be a column density of 10 to the 20 and lower. So indeed, these filaments have the kind of densities needed uh, out of which the molecular clouds can form. <clears throat> Below here is a map of the mass to flux ratio, the log. So zero is about critical. Red is super is uh, uh, mu very much greater than one. So and uh, and here's magnetically dominated in blue. So as we come to more magnetically dominated place, you see the interstellar medium is indeed very strongly uh, magnetically dominated, whereas the filaments that are hatched out a bit by this mechanism uh, are not. They have uh, lower mass to flux ratios. That was at the moment of fragmentation. Here's one rotation later, uh, one rotation being at KPC where we are in the galaxy. The red region, just focus on those. Uh, that's where you get densities high enough that this is definitely a molecular cloud. And you see them here as fragments in those filaments <coughs> uh, shown here. Think of that very first picture I showed you of the observations um, scattered through here. And um, here is the mass to flux ratio shown here, so the column densities clearly showing that where there's molecular clouds, you also have supercritical flux. So we seem to have solved this problem in this simulation. If we look edge on uh, from magnetically uh, dominated down here, beta 0.25, to very weak field, if I put magnetic field in a gas disk, it has a pressure associated with it. So the disk is obviously thicker here then the thinner disk we get once the magnetic field isn't important. And if we look at these different times here, we see the clouds that are present here that are formed uh, very much more readily in the magnetically dominated case than here in the magnetically weak case. Because this magnetic instability got started right away and moved a lot of gas around quickly. So it's a great way to form magnetic molecular, molecular clouds. Um, just uh, since we're interested in distributions of magnetic field here, what's been happening to the field? So let me just show you this in the diffuse gas and over here in the dense gas. In the diffuse gas, just follow the black. This is time, uh, 100 up to 700 mega year, million years here. Uh, the toroidal field is in is this top graph. Uh, you see that gradually the toroidal field is being, is being well, is uh, being drawn away here, which stabilizes at the end of the simulation the uh, radial field component, which is uh, this one here, is ramping up. Uh, the BZ component, which is down here, uh, almost cancels out. So there actually is a BZ component, but this graph just showed you the value uh, added up. It should have taken the absolute value. but. The main point is that a radial peer field has appeared here. All of these three field components kind of come to similar levels, and they kind of saturate out. We've reached some kind of a steady state for this activity in you know, the model. And here's the behavior in the dense gas. So where did the radial field come from? Um, we think that's because of the filamentary floats in the plane, the flow is flowing along the films, and gravity starts to become important. Gravitational centers start drawing gas along the filaments, and that pulls toroidal field lines with them in somewhat radial directions. So that process is gravity is kind of setting up the radial flow that we're, and hence, uh, we think the magnetic fields in this. 
um, this is structure with radius. Let me just close on a few uh, final points um, in my last minute or two. Distribution of the clouds, we're just starting to do this. We are obviously suffer, we'd like to have resolutions better than 19 parsecs. So um, you know, take this with a little bit of grain of salt, but we do find then strongly magnetized cloud distribution is in black, the hydrodynamic is the red. Um, and you see the clouds peaking here a little bit up at a little past 10 to the 7 solar masses. The radii are up at around 120 parsec radius. And the column densities are a little bit higher than we would see in clouds today. Uh, there seems to be a narrower distribution. This is normalized to unity, column density compared to its peak. So this is just the structure of the distribution in each case. Um, but again, it's kind of a, a reasonable, um, as you might say, what's the difference between these clouds and purely hydrodynamic case? We are in the same mass range. Uh, but there are some different properties, as I mentioned. Finally, where's the source of turbulence here? Why did these things become supersonic? Um, shown over here is the condition of filaments just at the time of fragmentation, just at the point after the filaments have formed, but before gravitational and start to fragment the pieces. Um, this is the plot of the, of the Mach number. Mach number is here of maybe 10, shown for uh, Strongly magnetized, the black hydrodynamic is the red. Red is slightly, it's in fact a slightly just around thermal values. Um, if we come over to this picture here, one rotation later when gravitational fragmentation is set in, suddenly you see velocity dispersion, RMS Mach numbers going up to thousands, short of a thousand, let's say a few hundred. Uh, there's a systematic relation between the turbulent velocity and the cloud mass, which we think matches very nicely with the classic observational data about molecular clouds first discussed and noted by Larson in a famous paper in 1981. Uh, here, the source of the turbulence is not due to supernova. We have, no, we have no stars blowing up. We're not stirring the interstellar medium by supernova. We have to put star formation into this. All the motions you hear, see here is by Parker instabilities or gravitational instabilities in the galaxy. And you see we get the source of this velocity, to, of this turbulence, if that's what it is, um, by the onset of gravitational motions. So in my summary, um, this one, the main thing I want you to take away is that Parker instability can answer this problem global of how do you make star forming clouds out of diffuse gas that certainly will not form stars. You do this by by buoyancy, it's the global buoyancy, the Parker instability, gas falling into these valleys, creating long filaments, gas gathered in those into the dense peaks, produce your GMCs. Um, this is what drives the transition of an interstellar medium to supercritical case. My final remark would be, is this just some funny transient? Our answer, why we haven't simulated, is no, because Let's say we put star formation in. So we've done this, and stability gives clouds. Star formation will now start. The supernova will disperse those clouds back into a diffuse medium. And that diffuse medium, you'll kind of smooth out the magnetic fields again, and you could reset yourself. So we think that this could operate as a cycle. Um, and with that, I'll, I'll thank you very much for your attention. Uh, thanks, Ralph. Uh, question? Quick. Uh, go ahead. Quick. Uh, actually, I have two questions. Go back to your spectrum. Go back to your spectrum, your energy spectrum. I, I think <clears throat> I missed something there. Um, let's see. Was it back? Was it but this there one? There you go. Yeah. Okay. Did I understand correctly? You So y your initial conditions went from 40 kiloparsecs down to about 20-ish when you refined. We were, our last resolution scale was, yes, 20 parsecs. That's right. And the, and your length? the box, the galaxy filled, it, it, it went out to 10 kiloparsecs in radius, right? Uh, so I, I guess my first question is, um, I would expect to see you know, a factor of 200 in wave number, especially given the, those nice filaments at the end um, in your spectrum, and I don't see them. Am I missing something? Uh, what, so, what is this a spectrum of? Is this total? So these peaks going around 2 pi times 8, I mean, that, that would account for the fact that you had about, I think, 30 valleys going around those. This, was, this is measured, 
I forget exactly where this is measured here, but um, I mean, there is definitely a peak that shifts depending on the strength of the magnetic field, but I mean, there are many more modes here, indeed. I would, uh, given the size of those, the thickness of those filaments at the end, they look very thin compared to your 40 kiloparsecs right. box. And I would think your K5 would be much, much larger than that. Uh, uh, it's not, and I'm uh, I just they were the dominant the, energy carrying. Uh, so that's the thing. linear, the linear stage of the instability there, and going into the nonlinear stage where we're kind of measuring. Um, this is the kind of stage where we're measuring the, the oh. K phi. Yeah. Okay. Okay. We move so around. It's not here. the dominant. Yeah. Okay. So that was the time at which you took the spectrum. Yes. Yeah. Okay. All right, that was my misunderstanding. Okay. Second question was, real quick, it, uh, if you didn't have cooling. How efficient would this mechanism be, or what would even occur? So if we didn't have, uh, fact is the grass has to cool, but if you didn't cool, uh, it would still rise up and fall into the valleys. It may not become self-gravitating enough to flow yeah, along, yeah. so that gravity takes over. So you need the cooling for that. Yeah. Yeah, my question was exactly related to the cooling. Um, so can you tell, uh, tell us a little bit more about that? What kind of cooling did you have? Standard, what standard cooling curves. How, yes. Uh, yeah. so how, For interstellar gas. How short are those cooling times in practice uh, compared to the other dynamical times? Let's see if I've got some. Just Very short, right? It's fairly short. Um, I should have put some in data here for the cooling. You could look in the paper for all the data, but it's standard. I think we have the residents Koyama and Utsuka, kind of the latest cooling curves for interstellar gas that we used here. Nothing and uh, do you get some that. instabilities with this cooling curve? Um, it's used indeed in studies for thermal instabilities, yes. I mean, this is what Roby Banerjee and others use, uh, yes. Okay, thanks. <clears throat> I was just going to ask if you if you start with a so if you start with um, a field that's not ordered but is random and you right. start with a turbulent background, right. it, it might be interesting to compare. In other words, do you do you need the laminar and large scale ordered field to make it work? It would seem if if the field were random and tangled, it would be primarily random and tangled with already turbulent fluctuations. There, it, it might be harder to get. I think that's exactly the state. Look at the magnetic field state here. Yeah. Uh, at the end of all of this activity, we have strong inter gravitational interactions between the clouds. You can still see that it's predominantly toroidal. It's still predominantly plater. The, the vertical loops will, I suppose, break off um, ultimately. Uh, you know, if we, you see it settling down to some sort of a steady state. Um, star formation will churn this up, of course and scramble these fields a little bit more. But we do know that the interstellar medium, puzzlingly, it interestingly has a fairly ordered field. We know that from the Planck data. And I wouldn't say that this is crazily disordered. So our hope is that after putting star information in, um, that in fact you would regain a reasonably, it doesn't have to be perfectly laminar by any means, but it should be dominated by toroidal field. The, the, the measurements show the random field dominating the ordered field. Yes. So I didn't know how that, how that fits in. Right. Okay. Uh, let's thank Ralph again. Thank you. So we have the last talk of the day. Switch. We need uh, oh, just a second. We need the microphone. I'm loud. So. <laughs> I already did. I, I did okay. the switch. Right. I, I switched myself, so I didn't know where to put it. Let's see where we have. Do we have something? Uh, here's pocket. Something popping up or not? Not 
just it's finding it, but um, doesn't seem to like it. So let me see what is going on here. No, no, it's fine. It's just not synchronizing with this projector. I have no idea why. Let's try this. Popping up? No. Hmm? Won't make any. Won't, won't make any difference. We can try, but let me say and show. Now something came. So let me mirror this place. Then usually it works because it will be horrible resolution, but it might work. Does it do something now? Yeah, it doesn't do anything. Oh, the newer the, the newer the computer, the harder it gets, oh. right? No, no, we can try two. I mean, we can try two. Yep, yep, yep. It was plugged in the wrong one. Well, then can you go here for? You have to be in two. No, now it's two. Okay. Yep. Ah, okay. That might explain it. <laughs> I can plug it again. There's something back there. There's nothing here. But okay, there you go. It's there? Wow, amazing. Okay. Well, let's see where the silver X once I start PowerPoint. <laughs> yes. Now, now I've got the windows here, so this is not good. So I have to kill this one. I'm sorry. Let me see here and show. Yes, there we are. Well, thank you for having me. Um, it's, it has been an interesting conference so far. Um, definitely Boulder. It's not working. Yes, it is. So I guess I'm speaking too quiet, so this can be changed. So, uh, okay, well, it's fun to be here. Um, so I'm going to report on work that was conducted by Holly Capello, who is here on this, on this picture here in my laboratory and it all started in Göttingen, uh, I don't know, five, six, seven years ago when uh, we had together with Laurent, who's sitting in the back here, um, have tried to get a joint research center which in Germany is a really big thing and I'm not an astrophysicist, I'm a fluid physicist or a condensed matter physicist who plays with fluids and the question was can we do something in the laboratory that is of relevance to astrophysics inside this, this joint research center? And so we started to talk to, uh, to Jürgen Blum, who is uh, at, at Braunschweig, and Hubert Klar, who is sitting back in the room. And we came up with the idea, perhaps it is possible to actually do a streaming instability type experiment in the laboratory, on the laboratory scale, to understand protoplanetary disk, or planet formation in protoplanetary disks. And so this started out that way, and then there was also Anders Johansson, who was up there, and Michelle Lamberts, who joined this later, and Hai Tao Zhu, who is now a professor at Tsinghua University in, in Beijing. And so the question, and I don't have to really tell you that much, but basically you have the star, which is shown up here, and once the star is, I mean, the resolution is really horrible, but okay. Once, once, the, once, the star is firm, once the star is formed, so once the dust collapses, then you have very little time, actually, to form a planet. So you have the protoplanet disk. And how do you see this? Well, you can look at the spectra from, any, from, from observations. And what you see is that there is a, there's basically in the spectra, you see, this peak, you see some distribution. One part you associate with the black body, with the radiation from the star. And the other one you, you associate with the disk. And then off the white, just the disk seems to be disappearing. And when the disk is disappearing, you would say, well, you know, they must have, the planets must have formed. And then so if you look at this, 
So this here is the near infrared excess fraction. And you plot this as a function of million years. What you see is that most of the action is going to sit in the region between 0 and about 6, 7 uh, a million years, which on at astronomical time scales is tiny. So what that means is you have to have planets form over a very, very short period of time. And so how is that possible? How is that done? And I don't have to talk to those of you who have worked on the streaming instability. I mean, basically, what you have is you have this, this process. So you start out with very, very small dust. This dust accumulates by collisions. It makes something like a snowball. I mean, it's really very so You have to imagine this is something very soft. There's some electrostatic inf uh, in, uh, interaction, possibly. There might be some magnetic hydrodynamics in the background. But basically, you have to collapse this dust to something bigger and bigger and bigger. And then what you realize is to really get a collapse to a planet, you need something where you have to have basically a clump or a concentration of mass, which is of the order of, let's say, a kilometer, or something like 500 meters to a kilometer. And then we know what happens. Then we can make every simulation I've seen so far makes, but just because of the capillary disk that you have, this big object is moving around. It just collects dust and makes, makes planets. Now, the problem is that. At one meter, you have a problem. So once these dust particles are about a meter, you get a problem. And there's two problems. One problem is you get in these protoplanetary disks, there's turbulence. We've heard about it, right? And we, we know there's turbulence. And so these dust particles have differential velocities, and they will hit each other. And so when they hit each other, Jürgen Bloom has shown in the lab that if you have these balls and you shoot them at each other, they just burst and collide, and you will have smaller particles again. So you can't make a bigger object just by this collision. But let's say this wouldn't be the case. Then the problem also is you have radial drift in, the, in this. And this is coming because of the star. So you have here the star in the middle. You have here your little dust particles flying around. And what you realize is that there is a different that, that the dust initially is on its capillary disk, but the gas actually has a differential velocity because of the properties of the gas, because of the heating of the, of, of the star. And so you get a differential velocity, and so this means the star, these dust particles will experience some drag. And then when you, when, you, when you analyze this, and this was done by Weidenschilling, for example, in 1997, when you analyze this, so this is the, the, the velocity, the radial velocity, infall velocity. You plot this for the particles, and you plot this as a partic uh, particle radius in centimeters. Then you realize you can probably not read this, but this is 10 centimeters. This is a one meter. What you realize that you realize that there is a peak, and this peak is exactly at one meter. And what that means is that particles of a typical size of a meter just fall into the star, and they fall into the star too fast to actually explain how planets can be formed. So we have a problem. So we are on Earth. We have seen lots of extra solar, uh, extra uh, lunar, uh, extra solar uh, planets. They, they all exist. There's lots of them. So it seems to be a generic uh, phenomenon. You can also see these things, by the way, very nicely in observations from different angles. And so what that means, we know planets are being formed. And, and Hubert and Anders and others have been worrying about this a lot in simulations. And we said, can we contribute something by experiments? Now, you, you, uh, it turned out it's not an easy task to do this. So, so what happens here is just shown. And, and so what people said is, let's, let's look at this. So it just falls into the star, which is shown in my little animation here. And so the question was, is there a possibility to do this? And so one possibility is to say, well, let's assume that we have this all flying around on this Keplerian disk. And now we know that we need a density fluctuation that's large enough to produce a protoplanet. And once you have the protoplanet, we are fine. And so one of the ideas was that there is a drag-induced instability where whole chunks of particles, not just meter barrier, not only meter-sized particles, but let's say like 6 or 10 centimeter particles, accumulate in a, in a big, huge, gigantic cloud. There could be a paraclinic instability, or it could be the streaming instability. And by some reason, there's this density fluctuation. And then once you have that one, you're fine to do this. And the question is, is there something like this drag induced instability, and you can, you can write down two fluid equations to do this. You say there's the dust, uh, there's, there's the gas, and there's the particles. And you can make these two fluid equations. And there were these papers here that showed, yes, indeed, there's possibly in these two fluid equations, there's an instability to this drag induced instability. Uh, recently, there have been also papers on resonant drag instabilities uh, from, from, uh, from uh, Caltech. 
where, where this has also been uh, considered. And so the question is, are there some mechanisms that produce this? And when we looked at this, we, after talking to the specialists, we are not specialists, so we had to talk to specialists, they told us, well, guys, you have to be a little nervous about many, many things. The first one is, there's going to be two types of drag out there. There's Stokes drag and there's Epstein drag. So Epstein drag, to remind you, is when the mean free path of the gas is roughly the size of your particles. And then you get a very different drag law where you have the speed of sound in the air and so on and so on. And so this is the Epstein drag and the Stokes drag. That all is described by the Knudsen number, of course. If the Knudsen number is one, then you would see you're in this regime where you go over where the particle size is roughly the mean free path of the gas, and the Knudsen number is one, and so you have continuum limits for very small Knudsen number. Then you get an, a continuum with free slip con uh, conditions uh, in this range. Then from 0.1 to 10, you have a transition, and then smaller than 10, uh, where the Knudsen number is, is 10, and larger, then you actually have uh, uh, no right exactly. Then then you basically have the the Stokes Stokes track regime, right? And so so you have, uh, you have the molecular free free path. So the particles are tiny. When the particles are tiny, you get that. When the mean free path is much much larger than the particles. Okay. And so what we asked ourselves: Where should we do our experiment? What would be the right region to do our experiment? And so, I mean, we have we talked to astrophysicists and. What you find out is that there's a Stokes-Epstein transition in, in a minimum mass solar nebula. And when you find out, you find these formulas here. And so what that means is when you're at 1 AU, you see that the typical particle size would be 6.4 centimeters. And it turns out this particle size is exactly in the region where you're just between Stokes and Epstein. So what that means is you cannot do a Stokes experiment. You shouldn't do an Epstein experiment, by the way, which you couldn't do. <laughs> I mean, I wouldn't know how to do that. You would probably have to do some plasma fluids. You can't do this with a normal gas. It's impossible, because you can't find small enough particles to do this. And so the idea was, let's do this with a normal gas. Can we build an experiment to do this? And here's our solution. So what we said is, let's build an experiment, which you kind of know from, from like granular matter or fluidized beds, where we have something like a fluidized bed, but it's completely different. Namely, the particle loading is going to be much, much slower, much smaller. Let me come back to, to my little table here. Did I have my little table? Oh, yes, this is right here. So what's also important is you need a certain volumetric filling fraction, and you need a certain mass loading. So the mass loading is volumetric mass loading, which just means how much mass, solid mass, you have compared to the gas mass. So if the filling fraction, you can reach this, for example, in an experiment that, that we have done, where we use steel particles, so stainless steel particles, where we basically have almost filling fraction, which is tiny, but we still have a mass loading of one. And so this is where we, after long trial and error, we, this is where we, that's what we found most convenient to do because it gets the closest to the atmospheric, uh, to, the, to the situation in, in astrophysics. And so what we, what we build is basically, we build an experiment which is about uh, 1.6 meters high. It has a plexiglass wall over here. In the bottom, we have something at the top. We have a collector. And then we put, this, we put this whole thing, we put this on a vacuum pump. And then this way, we can produce uh, vacuums down to, let's say, 1 millibar and even less, where there is a flow of about 1.5 meters per second through the device. If you put the particles in, then the particles will start to levitate in here. They will still fly out of the apparatus. We can't avoid that because it's hard to match everything. And what, what, you, what you find then is that in this regime, you have to make sure that you have a very nice flow profile. And as I, the flow profile is actually quite nice. So here you see the flow profile is parabolic. parabolic. This is at about 10 millibar because it's very harder to PIV measurements, particle image velocimetry measurements, at very, very low densities of the gas. So we have a smoke. We have smoke going through. We took PIV measurements. And this way, we can measure the flow profile. You have a little bit of fluctuations here, but these are very, very rare. If you actually measure the standard deviation, what you find is a very, very nice. So this is from 1 centimeter to for minus one centimeter to the other one centimeter. This is where we measure in the experiment. You see that the velocity profile is quite flat. And you see that the, the standard deviation is so tiny that you cannot, cannot even plot it on this plot. And so we have a very steady velocity profile, at least without the particles, and so on. To do experiments with particles is difficult, because if we put the smoke in these experiments, at these very low pressures, we cannot do PIV anymore. So we actually do not know 
we expect that this flow carries over. This is just the parabolic flow file. No turbulence, by the way. These particles are so tiny that the Reynolds number of the particles is much, much smaller than one. And also the flow in this device and this diameter in this pipe is going to be completely laminar. There's no turbulence to be seen anywhere in sight. Okay? Down here, I wanted to, I just, we have two cases which I will show you later. And so this is the regions where we have the particle velocities in our apparatus. So what you will have is you will have the flow going through very quickly and the particles flying through roughly with 30 centimeters per second. And then we have to have some video equipment to measure this. Okay, so how do we do this? Well, what you do is you have to play a few tricks. So the first thing is you have to make sure to get this kind of flow profile, you have to very, have a very, very controlled inlet region. And so here we have basically, this is a, this is a sieve. So these are, this is metal which has been sintered to become little particles. And this way we let the air go through this de device through this very, very, through the sieve. And so this way we have a very, very flat flow profile. Then we have this little cylinder, this little collector here. There's a mesh here. So if particles fall down, they, they don't fall out of the apparatus. They don't fall down here. They will actually stay over here. So this is the bottom. And then the top end, the problem is I told you the particles will leave the apparatus, right? And we can't always pour in new particles. And so you have to catch the particles before they leave your experiment. And so we were lucky. We came up, they came up with this design here where you expand the flow. And when you expand the flow, the velocity of these particles goes down because the drag goes down. And it turns out that this not only the big, some particles which just stick to the sieve up there and they will never be seen again, other than you turn the apparatus off and everything falls down, but some particles will go exactly into this region and you can adjust the flow speed to be pulled up, go to the side, fall along this funnel, fall down here on this side, go back into the stream and be recirculated. And we were able to show that that not only is a great way because we put in particles between 15 and 65 microns because we can't buy them differently. So you put the poly dispersed particles in there, but it turns out the fluid itself sorts them. And you have almost a mono dispersed distribution just because the, the big ones stick on the top, the light ones are the light ones are gone. And so this way you have a particle selection mechanism. And so we always have particles fall down on the side where the velocity is zero. They go into the middle and then they come up again. So we have a continuum situation with almost homogeneous situation. And so what we do is, this is shown over here. So you, you, go, you, you basically take your apparatus, oops, you take your apparatus, you pump it down, right? So the pressure goes down, you know, we go down from atmospheric pressure to something like, like a million. Then we seed the particles. And then what you see here is the pressure then is constant. And actually the particle, everything is in steady state. Also the particle density is in steady state. And so this way we have a very nice experiment to conduct this. And now the question is, how do you analyze all this? You know, what do you do? And so we have a lot of experience in particle tracking in Göttingen. We do this in clouds. We do this with water droplets. We do this with plastic particles in, in a fully developed turbulent flow. And so what you do is you take three high-speed video cameras, which you calibrate very, very carefully by having a mesh which you bring in from above, where in the middle you see here three black pixels that tells us where the mesh is located. And then we make a calibration in the pinhole camera model to calculate in 3D where these particles are. And we have about, uh, uh, we have a resolution of about uh, uh, 10 micrometers on the side, so to speak, where we see the particle per pixel. And with this, we can actually locate the particles here in the middle. So we have the three cameras. Then we have a code that takes all this into account. It has a linear correction for aberrations of all the optics. And then we can, we can calculate back. So we've been doing this the last 20 years, so we kind of know what we're doing. You just have to believe me. And that's why all these other physicists are involved in this project that I didn't mention, because they helped us with all the technology and Holly. And so what you find is something like this. And so here you have camera one, here you have camera two, camera two, zero, one, and two. And these are just the particles flying through. And we take pictures at two kilohertz. So we have a data frame of about, a frame rate of about two kilohertz. And so we can follow all the particles and let them just fly through the experiment. And now the question is, where did we do our experiments and what did we select as the optimal range? And so this is shown over here. So I have to tell, so this is continuum out here. Then this is the fleece slip region, is this, is this darker green. Then the transition region is this blue. The free molecular path is down here. And the other one, this is where you have nine half lambda 
which was what I showed you before, is right over here. And our experiments are being done right down here in the particles. And you see these big, big green lines. And you say, well, what's going on? You know, why is the particle size distribution so big? Well, our experiments were conducted here, but in reality, it's like this. Because once the experiment runs, we were able to show that out of this big distance of particles that we put in, only a very, very own distribution is there. And so we really have particles of one given size, which makes the experiment nice. Otherwise, we would have had trouble in calculating the drag law, doing everything. It's just very hard. So by construction, we were lucky. This resiphoning effect basically did the particle sorting for us. And just by changing the velocities, you could select different particle sizes. So that's how this was done. And so, so we have, have this experiment, and so when we have the, so we are basically, when I'm reporting, I'm reporting about on this and this, but let's look at the data. So when you look at our table up here, these are, this is the pressure that we had, so it goes from 2.7 millibar all the way to eight. The, the Reynolds number of the containers of order 30, let's say. The particle, now you realize we have a little bit of a problem with this data set and that, because the particle density is very low at any given time, right? At any given time, we have very few particles inside. While here, we have about 15 and 21 particles, which is fine. The mass fraction is tiny, 10 to the minus 8, 10 to the minus 7, right? So there's almost no particles there. There's very few particles per cubic centimeter. The epsilon is, goes from uh, 0.06 to about 1, 1.5. The friction time is 0.1 seconds. So this is the stopping time in the flow. And uh, this is the diffusive time scale, which is, is given over here in seconds. And then uh, this is just the particle diameters that we have measured. And so you see it's a very, very relatively narrow distribution compared to what we had put in originally. And these are the number of trajectories that we have. So you see that this one, we have 65,000 trajectories. Here we have 100,000, and we have about 200,000 trajectories that we have measured. And so now we have to measure something. Right now we have a nice apparatus. It works. I hope they've convinced you that the flow is steady, as, as steady as we can make it. Now we have to do something. And so what we do is, if, what, we, what you have to do now is you take either a little volume where you measure, or you take a whole stencil where you measure, so at a given radius, or we make cylinders, basically little, little cutouts, like, like cylinders that go down and average over a certain distance. And so you will see all this data. And there were a few surprises for us, things we did not expect at all. So the first one is, you can plot here for, this is Knudsen approximately one, you can plot the velocity difference of two particles as a function of z in the middle of the apparatus in the x, y, and z direction. Well, it turns out in the x, y direction, they're just completely quiet. There doesn't seem to be anything. They just sit there. We're about 50 centimeters up, which is about four stopping times or five stopping times. So we are in steady state. So these particles have definitely reached in the observation volume steady state. So we not, don't have transients anymore from the particles being accelerated in the flow. And so what you see is there's a, this flat line over here. This is very nice. And then you see, well, there's a differential velocity. This is meters per second. The particles clearly see it's negative. What that means is the particles are catching up with each other. Right? So this is negative velocity here of minus, uh, so this is 5 centimeters per, um, yeah, right? 5 centimeters per second. And so these particles are, the particle pairs seem to catch up with 5 centimeters per second if they are very close to each other. If they go further apart, they seem to be catching up less. But here's the first surprise. They seem never to lose the catch up mode. So what that means is there seems to be a long range drag induced interaction where even when the particles are far from each other, they still know that somebody's in front of them. Right? I mean, this week, I, you know, if somebody would have asked me, I would have said it has to go to zero, right? But we can't get rid of this. I mean, there's anything we've tried, we cannot get rid of this. So this is true. There's nothing wrong. And now what you can do is you can do, go, go to Knudsen smaller than one, which is more the regime, which is the Stokes regime. So you get closer to Stokes, and you see the effect is much bigger. So let me pop this back up and down. So, oops, sorry. So this is the one, one. And this is smaller than one. And so what you see is there's a huge effect when you actually just increase the drag law a little bit and change the drag law a little bit, the effect is big. And actually, the differential velocity is stronger. So in other words, the instability is stronger, what we're seeing. Now, what we can also do is we can, uh, so this was the relative velocity as a function uh, of, of z. So we can also look at the, 
Uh, this is the same thing again, but this time what we do, we do this little cylinder trick. So what we say is we take a cylinder, a stencil in the middle, then we go to a cylinder, another cylinder, another cylinder, and so we have little disks, and then we ask ourselves, all the particles in this little radius, in this little disk, how do they correlate over Z? And we take all particle pairs, which are above, and just see what is the relative velocity, and what we find is when we're very, very close, so this is the middle of the apparatus, so this is just one millimeter, from zero to delta one millimeter, you get the blue curve, and then you do this for everybody else, and surprise, surprise, it seems to be independent of the radius. So what that means is not only over this one centimeter of these two centimeters in the apparatus, there seems to be not much happening. So particles at one centimeter away seem to be catching up in average with each other as fast as they do in the middle. So there's no radius. I showed you the velocity profile it was very flat. And so there's really a global mode in the system where the particles seem to be catching up. And everything I show you in the future is about this global mode. Can we pin it down a little bit more? And can we understand it better? And so then what you can do, of course, you can do Knudsen uh, smaller than one again. Well, the effect is the same. It's just it's stronger. And then you can also ask the question. I have to always remember what I'm plotting. And so you can also ask the question, if I go now not in the r direction, but I go in the z direction, average over z, what do I find? How do these particles catch up with each other when I make little planes as a function of r and z? And what you find here is, again, this is the velocity in z in meters per second, and these are the different z's. So I go down one millimeter, two millimeters, three millimeters, four millimeters, and so on, so on up to nine millimeters. And so eight to nine millimeters. And what I find is when they're close to each other, well, there's no radial dependence or not much radial dependence. Then they go up and then finally they go to the stationary state where they seem to be all catching up roughly at the same speed. Now this you can also do for Knudsen smaller than one. And then you can say, well, can we look at this as, a, as the function of how many particles we have in average inside? Right? You would like to know if the particle density is high, is there something else in the experiment as if the particle density is low? Because sometimes you only have very few particles. After all, this is random. And so we have done this. And what you see is, so here we go from a total density of about 0 all the way up to about 25 particles inside in our any measurement volume. And then we, we basically make it conditional, our measurements conditional on this property. And what you find out is too. So this is the Knudsen smaller than one regime for two different measurements. And what you find in this kind of Stokes drag regime, you find that the velocity actually decreases slowly as a function of particle density, which is kind of makes sense, right? You get, which means since the velocity, so let me, I, I have to understand, yeah, there's stronger drag. So the particles fly up. So this is just the velocity. This is not the pair velocity. It's just the velocity of the particles themselves, right? So if you have clumps of particles, which is over here, these particles go up slower in the apparatus than particles that are less clumsy, which makes sense. This would be what you would expect in the Stokes regime. Without, so they, they have more drag, and by more drag, they can go up. While in the Knudsen, in this Knudsen 1 regime, it's exactly the opposite. Well, it's constant, possibly. Who knows? I mean, it's hard to say. OK. And so then what you can do is, of course, you can look at the five minutes. You can look at the probability distribution functions, and you see, well, you know, they're they are almost Gaussian. Of course, the peaks move to the left depending on, on the, the number of particles you have in the volume. And so you can analyze this and, and see, see what it does. But then what you can also do is, is there some special correlations between the particle number density and so on and so on. And you find out, well, if you have, if you just take the normal clump, uh, basically the number density correlation function for without any bias in, 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 in Z, uh, in the number, then you find the blue curve. Then if the particles are less dense, then you find the green curve. If they're denser, you can find the, the red curve. And then you can divide these through each other. And what you realize is that as a function of, of tau of time, you see that you started one, they all correlated, and then they go back to one, which means that you're basically back to, to the situation where everything is just uncorrelated. So this is, this is kind, of, kind of nice. OK, now you can also do this for the other, other, other case, but I don't want to talk about this because I'm out of time. And so then there was another question. And this, this plot, some of you know, some of you don't know yet. The question was, what is the number density cross-relation? 
So we have to ask ourselves, how is this all distributed? How is the cross-correlation between the chunk down here and the chunk over here? And what we find is that, so, so this is the distance in millimeters. So if you take the blue curve, it's just millimeters. This is a function of time delay. Then you get this blue curve here. And then if you go down in distance, what you notice is the particles spread out more and more diffusely, and the system is pretty much homogeneous. There's no correlation anymore between what's coming in on the bottom and the stuff on the top. So it's highly correlated on the top, and it's almost not correlated on the bottom, and the correlation decays as a function of time. And in the, in the, in the Knudsen's more than one regime, it looks a little bit different, but basically this thing just broadens out. So these are the res experimental results, and we're still trying to wrap our head really around it. Um, what it cries for is some real numerical simulation, some really understanding. So, so we have also looked at these papers on, these RDL, on the resonant induced, you know, resonant drag instability. I mean, this seems to be some kind of, this definitely instability. We know it's an instability. We know what the evolution is. There need to be more experiments done because you would like to measure two, you would really like to know the flow. Now that means not a graduate student. And you would like to know what possibly the correlations are at different heights to see whether this is a fully developed instability or whether this is still a transient because we can't say that. Remember, we start at the bottom, we go through five stopping times, and then we would say we're out of the transient, and then the question is, what happens above, and one could do two camera systems. Actually, the best would be to have a camera system that just drives with one meter per second with the experiment, and just takes a picture. That would be the perfect thing, because then you can really follow the particles as a function of time, and see how this instability develops. We have, I talked to Hubert yesterday, I mean, the resonance drag instability assumes that there's a pressure high somewhere, and then you, you basically, because of pressure high, you accumulate more particles. Because you accumulate more particles, you get more drag. If you get more drag, the other particles catch up, and so on and so on. And the pressure then changes in the gas. So this is this resonance drag instability. Well, we don't see much in velocity fluctuations, so it's not really clear how it's done. In the paper that was by Squires and Hopkins, exactly. I always say Eaton because there's another turbulence guy. Squires and Hopkins, they claim it also could be initiated just by density fluctuations. So you don't need pressure fluctuations due to the gas. It's good enough to have a fluctuation due to density fluctuations of the particles, and then you can get into the same cycle. And so it could be that this, this is the nonlinear evolution of this instability. We also did simulation with Anders, and where basically it did the pencil code, and I can show you. The simulations are supposed to mimic the experiment. Actually, these simulations, of course, beat us by far. So they put in a constant density, then they make their typical uh, situation. So, so this is, again, without rotation, with anything, just a simple drag instability. And what they find is, indeed, they find this clumping, and they see that this. Our experiment, if at all, when you, when you look at this movie, um, which I could step, stop perhaps. Our experiment, if at all, would just take one of these little clumps and follow them for a given time, and then the particles are out in the top, get caught, and fall down again. So at best, we see the nonlinear evolution, initially a nonlinear evolution of the process, but then it's over because the experiment is over. Remember, you have 30 centimeters per second velocity in, this, in, in real space, and so the thing is only 90 centimeters, so in a, you know, in three seconds, the experiment is over, right? And so, so we think that we could never see this. We could never see this very strongly nonlinear evolution, but we think. And when we compare to the numerics, it seems to be halfway convincing. I mean, one can discuss about it, but this is how science is. So let me, let me say, so I think this is the first experimental observation where this has been done. I know Hubert has another paper submitted, which is in a different regime, correct? And. Uh, this is, this is in, a, in a very dilute regime, so there's very, very few particles per, per volume. But in addition, you see a strong effect. Uh, we did a literature research, a very careful literature research on any type of drag experiments in the Epstein regime. It's nil. There's actually almost nothing. So experimentalists, no, theorists know about it, but experimentalists have not dared to, to dare into this, into this thing. And it's only because of astrophysics that we have done this. And so there's really no, no explanation so far. It would be wonderful. And we think there's a collective particle drag reduction. We definitely see convincingly that these particles are catching up. Uh, we, we, we think this is definitely not a, an artifact because it's completely reproducible. It's independent of radius which tells you this is a collective phenomenon. This is not a two-particle phenomenon. And it's definitely not the bicyclist driving in front of another bicyclist. There's no turbulence involved whatsoever. This is just laminar 
drag interaction, and it's probably some kind of resonance interaction. It has to be, because otherwise, how would you get this? So I, if I would have to put my, my bet in there, I would say it's probably something like, a, like this streaming, it's definitely like the streaming instability, but probably also is this, this linear analysis of the resonant drag instability. It has to be there somewhere. But for that to really pin it down, we have to do an experiment. And with this, I close. So these are the people that have worked on this. Uh, it was a long project, and I would like to thank the German Research Foundation and Max Planck for the support. And of course, my colleagues for listening to non-astrophysicists. Thank you. Um, it's late. Go ahead. If there's applications to your measurements to, to how you initiate uh, dust storms well, on Mars. Well, so, so, I mean, the, one of the big difference here is that the number density of particles per volume is really tiny, right? And so we are not in the sediment. Actually, we have nothing to do with sedimentation, and we are really far away from that regime. And that regime has not been, typically people worry about sedimentation, transport, and so on and so on. In this experiment, we are very far away. This is a very subtle effect of where something that's extremely dilute but when you loft things to high altitudes, I think you would get into that. You region. probably get that, actually. Yeah. So I, I, I've never heard that people associated anything on But it could be, of course, yeah. yeah. Because once the air is dilute enough and the mean free pass goes up, right? Right. Then you would have exact, and the particles are small enough. And, and even, you know, these are basically little rock particles, right? I mean, this is right. steel, eight kilo, you know, eight, eight, eight tons per, per, per cubic meter. I mean, this is a huge, huge density. So it's like rock. Interesting. Very interesting. Any other comments? Axel. You showed the C sub n n correlation function as yes. a function of tau. So first of all, that was extremely sharp. Um, would you not need to look at shorter time separations? This one? Sec no. Which Not's one? Which one was it? Uh, so no, it was as a function of tau, yeah. Hmm. Yeah, maybe that one, yeah. That exactly. one, that one, right, yeah, 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 that one, yeah. Um, uh, would one not l like to look at this as a function of separation instead, because then you see the clustering. Right, well, that's the other plot. Could you see clustering? We have done that. Yeah, yeah, we see clustering. Uh -huh. And ha can you compare that with the numerical simulations? Well, uh, we have done some numerical. I, I actually, I'm not, you have to wait to ask Holly or I send you the paper. There's a comparison in there where we try to do this very carefully. I mean, the paper tries to be extremely fair to the experiment and also to the simulations and, and leaves a lot of things open, to be honest, because one would really like to pin this thing down. I mean, I, I still look for the real mechanism, right? Because we don't know what the flow does, right? If I would know what the flow is, what the pressure is, but the pressures are so tiny, right? I mean, how do you measure a pressure of, you know, if you have two millibar and, and you have to measure fluctuations of 0.01 millibar, I mean, how do you do that, right? Or, and, and particle tracking you can't do because you need tracers. And the other, the PIV, actually the PIV measurements, Holly did with cigarette smoke. So we, she went to, went to John Lawson, who is a specialist in PIV, and he said, look, I help you. And then sure enough, we could measure it. Before we made a construction where we made a little temperature pulse, and then we measured how long it takes for the temperature to go from A to B. That's another way to measure this, actually. But it turned out to be not very reliable because you need extremely fast temperature sensors. Right, because you get a little blip, and then you say the time difference between blip and source and blip was so and so long, and so, and then you have to scan it, and so the real solution, and we gave up on that after about a year, and then Holly decided to do this uh, thing. I should also mention, perhaps, for those uh, female scientists who are in a PhD, you can get a PhD and can get these results and still have a baby during your PhD. So it can all be done, no problem, okay? So she has now a little daughter who is now about two or so. And uh, so she, she stopped doing research for a year and I froze it all up and said, let's hope we don't get scooped. Well, that's what you have to hope and we didn't get scooped, I hope. And so, so it can be done. And so if there are any suggestions from you, I'm here for the banquet. I would be very, the experiment will be continued in, in Tsinghua. So Haidao has now the experiment as a collaboration with Max Planck and he will continue this experiment in the future. And so if there's any suggestions we should measure or simulations, I would be very open uh, to any suggestions you have. So any criticism is more than welcome because it can only help. It's a, it's a, it's, so in other words, we see the phenomenon 
but the physics behind it is not quite clear yet. But it's there. It's indisputable. I mean, we, we cannot get rid of it. We've tried. So it's there. So it's, it's clearly that the drag phenomena exists, which means that in the protoplanet disk it will exist. Of course, there's also rotation and you know, everything. The whole complexity of, of rotation, and which we don't have here. And so this also motivates me. Let me say one last word before I disappear. I, for the last five, seven to 10 years, I have been pushing strongly for Earth-based experiments, which the Dresden experiment is an example for, where for little, relatively little investment compared to astrophysics and high energy physics, we could do amazing experiments to validate codes and physics. And I think this should, we should take really much more seriously than we have done in the past. I think plasma physics is, is highly developed. I mean, it's all there. We can do magnetohydrodynamic instabilities. We can do jets. We can do things. We can do these magnetic fluid experiments. We can do other experiments. This is a very simple experiment, right, which you can do. And there's a, a, there's a whole sea of experiments that we can do where the numeric should capture this also. Of course, they capture all the beautiful virtual reality out there, and, and, and there will be a system somewhere where you can verify your data. But I think to really nail the physics, we need some earthbound experiments where we are not shy of spending two, let's say 100K or 200K up to about five to 10 million, where we just say, look, let's just do it. And let's do it right. And so I've been trying to convince my colleagues from plasma physics to do this with me. And they need a little bit of it. These things take, are slow. But I think when we look around on the funding scheme, if we come together and say there's an experiment worthwhile, I don't think it's a problem. I think getting the money is actually, and the physics will be there. And we just have to say this is a good problem. We, we always stand behind it. And then you find some clever experimentalists and some clever theorists that say, let's put five years of our life or 10 years of our life into this topic and just finish it off and then have real good tests of simulations. And then one can really make it quantitative. And this is, this is something that I've been trying to push. I was on turbulence, the same thing, right? In turbulence, we all try to do turbulence experiments with almost nothing. And then we say it's the hardest problem there has been since in, in classical mechanics. I mean, how does that fit together, right? I mean, it's the hardest problem in classical mechanics. We have a feed theory that we don't understand. I mean, you, you guys were fighting about a feed theory where even the compress, incompressible limit of just the normal stuff is Stokes equation. We don't even know where the solutions exist. Right? We don't. I mean, the mathematicians can't show us that they, they always exist, right? We have, we have extremely intermittent flows. What do we do? We invest almost nothing, right? We, we, we do large scale simulations. There's a lot of money invested that costs a fortune. But in experiments, well, you know. And so I'm a big fan of the Dresden thing, or I'm doing that also a little bit in Göttingen. But it's cheap on the scale of high energy physics, synchrotron radiation, satellites. I mean, forget it. It's, it's nice. So, so I think if there's something that you think we should be doing, you have an experiment that you always were dreaming about, I would be very happy to hear. Thank you.